Hello, everyone. Welcome to Radical Sounds, to the discursive program. And my name is Alejandra Cárdenas, and I'm one of the co-curators of the festival with my colleague Talia Vega. And before I introduce uh, the two speakers that we're going to have today, I have some notes. First, that this event is not the only one from our program. Tomorrow we have more things going on in our website online. We have an streamed panel that is called Latitudes, moderated by Bitter Babe from Colombia, with panelists Juliana Derretida from Mexico and Chico Cornejo from Brazil. And we have four more lectures and video essays uh, from uh, different parts of the world. We have Aleida Rocha, Gregorio Fontaine, Rodrigo Toro and Donovan Hernandez, and Carlos Colmenares. And this is uh, gonna happen in our website, uh, radicalsoundslatinamerica.com, I think from 2 p.m. Uh, or 5. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And yeah, before I give the stage to to hear uh, Pedro and Daniela, I want to say a few things because we are presenting today this publication, this little book we edit within the frame of the festival. And uh, uh, the name of the publication is Borden Listening, Escucha Liminal. And what I can say about it is that the aim of this publication was not exactly to theorize uh, Latin American sound and music like an even and uniform thing that exists like in contraposition to what's European, but uh, I would say like it's more to complicate things. And in my own experience, uh, I can say that complications come from specificity, from the located and lived experience of these stories. Uh, and moving away from uh, you know monolithic generalizations and cliches and exotizations and so on. And something that I really like about the ten pieces that we have here is how specific and situated each story is. Uh, we have zone art from Central America and Lima and indigenous ra radios in Brazil the Kitty Plus in Venezuela, Canto Cardenche in Mexico, and also the colonial character of sound recordings and reproduction technologies. And we, of course, in this publication are in many ways indebted to uh, Latin American decolonial thinkers and also Latin scholars uh, from whom we took the concept of, uh, of thinking from the borders. And in this sense, uh, the concept of border is not just a contraposition of the center and the peripheries, uh, but a liminal space uh, full of contradictions, but also possibilities, where concepts break apart and give uh, space to new concepts to emerge. And so, Border listening is about dwelling onto these borders to bring, bring to the foreground uh, sonic encounters uh, that inhabit these margins. And so uh, not all pieces here are about, uh, or, or neither of them are about resistance or proposals on uh, how to decolonize sound. There are, it's not a manual, you know, but it's, uh, I would say they just, complicate the terms that we inherit from the Western thought, and they complicate these term terms by locating them in different contexts. Uh, for example, what is silence, uh, or wh what can silence be uh, in a place like Latin America where silence has been used as a weapon of censorship? Could it be the same silence as uh, in avant-garde European uh, for, for avant-garde European composers, and what is soundscape? Could it be the same soundscape romanticized by them, like in front of 500 uh, years of 
ecological devastation uh, brought by colonial extraction and commodification. And finally, I, I think it's very curious uh, that none of these authors were aware of the name of the publication, which was decided just a few weeks ago. Uh, the project began because we did a, a really modest open call for uh, the colonial positions on sound and music and Latin American stories about music and sound, and we received all these uh, incredible uh, proposals, more than 20, from which, which we selected these 10. And I think for me, the name of the publication emerged on, in its own, and it's the only thing that I think that really interwaves all the text that we have here. And well, that's all that I'm going to say now. I'm going to give the stage to Daniela and Pedro. So, Daniela brings us a two sided story uh, as an artistic act of denunciation and symbolical transformation between La Guajira, North Colombia, and Battenfall, the electric utility for the states of Hamburg, Mecklenburg, Brandenburg, Berlin, Saxony, and Halt, Thuringia, and Saxony. Parallel to banning the coal extraction in Germany in order to protect the environment, the German import of Colombian coal is removing Wahoo people from their land, polluting their waters, and depriving them from basic rights. Daniela Medina Pot is an artist and writer, and writer currently part of the Master Kunst in Context program at the University of Arts of Berlin. Through specific site-specific research-based work, her practice explores the notion of the bordering and the othering. Through grassroots experiments, she investigates the entanglements between territory, language, and identity. She's also co-founder of Babel Media Art and writes regularly on Eigen Art Magazine and has participated in Flora Arts Natura, Lugar Edudas, and Four Beat Gallery Residencies programs. Her collective shows include End to End, Transmediale 2020, Center of Unfinished Business, Berlin, the Fifth Biennale of Performance, Galleria Santa Fe, Bogota, Future Heritage, among others. And then we're going to have the lecture by Pedro. Uh, that explores how the police make extensive use of sonic design practices, not only to exercise direct violence against marginalized population in the city, but also to hyperamplify a sense of permanent threat in the so-called pacified favelas of Rio. Conducting his, this narrative is a jukebox that sits in a bar in a neighborhood in northern Rio. And here, Pedro is a Brazilian researcher, sound artist, and educator working with the colonial articulation of sound and listening in the policing of border and urban spaces. He holds a PhD from the University of Arts and is a former research and teaching assistant in media and cultural studies at Henry Heine University at Dusseldorf, as well as a lecturer in musicology at the Humboldt University at Berlin. So. Sorry, we just break all the regulations from COVID. So, the land of thunder and lightning. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge all sources and resources that allow me to be here right now the environmental conditions, and the network of affections that sustains me. Also, all the energies behind and up front this festival. Now, there should be an image. Uh, her presentation? I guess we can start without the... Ah, yeah. Here. Yeah. So, I... Uh, yes, they are there as well. So, I would like to tell you that this is the only visual I'll show, so I encourage you to close your eyes while I pronounce the following words. 
the association of noise and power has never really been broken in human imagination, argues Schaffer Murray in his book, The Soundscape, Our Sonic Environment and the Tuning of the World. Murray mentions that in earlier times, all natural events were explained as miracles. Loud noises, such as the sound of a thunder, evoked fear and respect back to the earlier times, seeming to be an expression of divine power. The colonial era was the imposition of a monotonal and singular vocal structure, which silenced the diversity previously there. As Schaffer mentions, linguistic accuracy is not merely a matter of lexicography. We perceive only what we can name. In a man-dominated world, when the name of, of a thing dies, it is dismissed from society, and its very existence might be imperiled. In the modern era, the respect for the natural sounds of a thunder, a volcano, or a storm was, respect, was re replaced by the respect to the sounds created by industrial machinery. There was a power shift. Every living being exists because all other living beings exist. Through euphonies and cacophonies of complex interconnection, life vibrates and echoes throughout the planet. There are connections that are more visible and easily imagined than others. The Amazon rainforest might be so diverse because it nourishes itself from the sand that travels on the wind from the Sahara Desert across the Atlantic Ocean. At the same time, the northernmost peak of South America is affected by Germany's energy consumption. Why is that? A possible starting point might be tracing resources back to their sources. A source is where components originate. It is usually active and its existence is often entangled within a complex environmental network. On the contrary, a resource is understood as a means, an asset that fo functions efficiently. Resources are often extracted and manipulated and obey market regulation. The difference between a source and a resource lies in human intervention. Humans transform sources into resources, adapting them to, the, to our demands. Resources are therefore often understood, understood in numbers. Through the transformation and numeric abstraction of resources, we often forget the sources they spring from and the workflow that lies behind them. In a similar process of abstraction in the neoliberal world we live in, the infrastructures and technologies that surround us have become deeply adopted by and adapted to our lifestyles, to the point of appearing as ubiquitous. In effect, a background noise we have learned to ignore. From within this these frameworks, we are unable to distinguish the apparatus that lies behind them not only on a technical level, but also in regard to the mo models they pursue and sustain. An equivalent on a smaller scale might be the energy that is powering this microphone right now. Where does our electricity come from? In the northern part of the South American continent lies the Guajira Peninsula, an extensive desert right on the Caribbean coast, which is home to the largest Aboriginal community in both Colombia and Venezuela. Originally a nomadic tribe having migrated 3,000 years ago from the Amazon rainforest and the Antilles to the desert, the Waju and Afro Waju have since preserved this territory as a communitary space. La Guajira is filled with oral contrast. In the background, the wind as a means of circulation, flowing with diverse speeds and intensities, roaring stereophonically across the territory. The wind shapes the paths of the sand and sculpts the sand dunes that give texture to the landscape. 
there are some places where the wind does not fluctuate. And that quietness and stillness corresponds with a funeral ritual, a celebration of life and death in the Wajú community at Cabo de la Vela. Along the coast, next to the infinite kilometers of sand and wind, almost as a surprise, a mass of salty water apiece appears, caressing the coast. Waves rock incessantly, receding, absorbing, and exploding repeatedly. Always different, but at the same time constant, mini-cyclical explosions, which despite their imposition, generate tranquility by repetition, or at least the illusion of repetition. Throughout the desert, there are Waju settlements called rancherias. They are built from trupillo tree and yotohoro, the heart of a dried cactus. Inside these rancherias, a hammock or chinchorro always hangs. Goats split while women of the community weave colorful mochilas and dresses. The needle transversing colorful threads, knotting, pulling, threading, accompanied by some chit chat. I wonder if those colors are a way to dialogue with the dry desert. During their daily work, shepherds from these communities use aerophone instruments, instruments in which the air vibrates mainly inside a tube. Sawawa, Wotoroi, Masai, Wawai, Kasha, and Tropa are all blown instruments, blown in reciprocal dialogue with the wind. Such instruments are used to lead the animals while also serving as a means of sound expression for the shepherd. The language of the Waju is Wayunaki. The consonants are long and the accent generally falls on the second syllable of the word. In rituals or celebrations, marking the first menstrual cycle of Waju woman, for example, when a request for a dream or the healing of some disease is made, the kasha, a bimembranophone percussion instrument, is played. Kasha is a type of drone made of pine or seiba. With a twisted goat, hide at, at its end. The instrument also leads the Yona Kasha dance, a celebration where two members of the community chase each other with their colorful dresses dialoguing with the wind. Nearby, one can hear the struggling engine of jeeps with their considerable tires and traction arriving from the urban centers to the desert. From within these vehicles, one can hear vallenato music ringing through the stereos rhythms and melodies from the urban region of Guajira that involve the accordion, the guacharaca, the maracas, and the box. In fact, some say that it's German settlers who in the mid of the 19th century brought the accordion to the municipality of Riohacha. The vallenata box was an Afro-Colombian addition that along with the guacharaca, an instrument from the Aboriginal communities, gives vallenato its particular sound. Colonial division of territories affected the Wayu and Afro-Wayu communities. They came to belong to two nation states, Colombia and Venezuela. While some borders have been shut down, despite geopolitical divisions, the communities strive for the preservation of the territory as a borderless living with its own memory. The Wayu and Afro Wayu understand themselves as a tribe of 56 families. The grandmother is the leader of the community, the Piachi, and the person in charge of healing. The Piachi is a self taught healer who has dreamed of her role and the way to carry it out. She has a, spe a special channel of communication through which she can express what the territory needs. According to the Waju worldview, the world was created by a romance between the rain and the earth. 
to make the earth happy, they were enchanted. And as it yodeled, thunder and lightning roared and released energy that allowed life to emerge. First the flora, then the fauna, and finally humans. Despite this myth, since 2010, there has been no more energy producing thunder or lightning, nor there have been raindrops chanting, as a result of which, in 2014, the territory was declared a region in crisis. The Piachi recently said in an interview, quote, the Maquira, our territory, is not good for walking anymore, nor for growing crops or nourishing our animals. We are all thirsty and slowly malnourished. We are burning, quote, In the midst of these conditions, Rejón, one of the largest open coal mines in the world, was founded. The landscape changes from a palette of light orange, blue, and green to a vast concave surface. A human valley of gray and black patches in combination with heavy machinery. Backhoes carve the earth. Machinery vibrates, digging and extracting. A cacophony of minerals. Industrial metal, a transformed mineral. Crashing and crumbling layers of earth in search of coal, a non-transformed mineral. The operation is so big that no human noise surpasses the acoustic presence and dominance of machinery. Huge wheels dig into the ground, crushing anything small. The sound of extraction is like that of something being forced out, and through this removal, immediately becoming something else. These incessant vibrations have dominated the landscape from 1976 until the present day. Cerrejón was both a promise of employment and development and a tool to bring attention to the zone. Nevertheless, it has turned out to be one of the main sources of problems for the, both the region and the community. Being mostly owned by foreign companies, BHP, Anglo-American, and Glencore, 98% of what Cerrejón yields is exported, with only 10% of total sales remaining as profit for the state. On top of that, Due to the centralized system of royalties, as well as regional mismanagement, the community rarely receives any profit. Beyond a disproportionate economic relationship, Cerrejón has had severe implications for the local Wajú communities, depriving them from the basic necessities and prioritizing the project's economic ambitions over the life of the community. Cerrejón has caused numerous cases of involuntary resettlement affecting the community's traditional lifestyle and subjecting them to conditions imposed by the management company. Moreover, deep excavation and mining has caused severely unhealthy air pollution. Due to inadequate consultation processes, the air is full of particles of coal which have already affected the health of newborn babies and also disrupted the balance of aquifers across the whole zone. On top of that, official sources affirm the mining companies are subject to controversial allegations related to displacement and collaboration with paramilitary. As some can imagine, the existence of a coal mine in the desert is highly paradoxical and problematic. Open coal mines require double the amount of water that closed coal mines do. Due to this structural conundrum, Cerrejón has privatized the Rancheria River, the main source of water in the desert. Furthermore, it has purposely dried out several of the streams that divert from the riverbed in order to extract coal from beneath them. In 2019 and 2020, after alerts from the community and deeper research carried out by Universidad Nacional and United Nations, 
the constitutional court to why sued the company for causing life-threatening pollution and human right violations. Today, Cerrejón is still operating with a license to extract coal until 2034. When will water be more valuable than coal? To ask when will water have a higher value than coal is to ask when our collective survival will have a higher value than the accumulation of profit by a few. With the 17 million liters of water extracted daily and the 4,700 members of the community whose life has perished due to unbearable conditions, it seems as if some of the states are being complicit in a genocide. Despite efforts to penalize multinationals and compensate the affected communities, the mechanisms of compensations fail to acknowledge the complexity of the effects and consequences over a longer time frame, not only environmental, but social, cultural, and symbolic. As postmodernist theorist Arturo Escobar says, the process of deterritorialization not only includes the dispossession of a population, but also the process of removing the territory from the population. The population is transformed. Are there economic measures that account for such involuntary transformation? What keeps Cerrejón's in existence is the fact that even with the penalties, the business is still highly profitable, which underlines this disproportionate, disproportionate value given to commercial interest. How to quantify the cultural and symbolic value of a river to an Aboriginal community? Such values are challenging to quantify, and most of the time they are not even recognized. But what if we were to really devise a real accountability that includes social, cultural, and environmental effects in both the immediate and longer term. As Natasa Petresin Bacheles suggests, by exploding their natural resources and hence by durably damaging their environment, industrialized countries owe a huge debt to countries of the South. This ecological debt is much bigger than the financial debt the South supposedly owes the North. Taking it, it into account would completely transform the way we think about global economy. Between Berlin's abundant Spree River and the Kopernike Strasse, actually across the window of this room, stands the Heise Kraftwerk, a combined heat and power plant in the Mitte district. Despite the fact that the energy company Fattenfall Heisekraft work is visually so imposing, an industrial castle with two large chimneys and red lights that dominate the landscape of the spray, its oral presence is barely perceptible. This absence of sound from such a large facility brings to mind an industrial deafness and the invisible trail that runs from resources to commodities. The industrial proceeding of energy remains concealed within the headquarters of the factory, but what is commonly heard instead of industrial noises is the vibrations of the energy the plant produces in the form of electronic music, floating from nearby venues, Kraftwerk and Tresor, for example. Electronic music is one of the first outcomes we can reclaim from such energy conversion. The power plant belongs to the Swedish energy group Vattenfall Europe Varme, which belongs to an energy, to a German subgroup responsible for the operation of the plant. Vattenfall is the electric utility for the German states of Hamburg, Mecklenburg, Fort Pommern, Brandenburg, Berlin, Saxony, Anhalt, Thuringia, and Saxony. As the sixth largest consumer of energy in the world, Germany imports more than half of its energy. Nonetheless, the country claims it is on a way towards being one of the world's most 
major renewable energy economies and has a reputation for its low carbon emissions. Vattenfall has taken the commercial decision to do business in Colombia, say, says the official website. Quote, Colombian coal is attractive. For Vattenfall, both for a commercial and a technical perspective and enables us to maintain a diversified sourcing portfolio. The official Cerrejón website affirms as well, we generate social, environment, economic and individual value for Guajira and the region of Colombia. In the land where thunder and lightning created life, there is not even water anymore. All this energy is now in the global north. Reviewing the national environmental indexes, which makes countries such as Germany, Norway, or Canada so proud in relation to the sources they import and the containers of waste they export, I can only think that these indexes are part of a neo-colonial strategy of distortion of ethics. What is the use of green certificates if they only include the domestic activities and ignore the respective importation of resources and exportation of waste? Green certificates should not be a national award, but should include a real account of the quality of energy produced and consumed on a planetary scale. When, we, when will we stop pretending the planet is not our common territory? When will we overcome the fiction of value determined by the market in which a barrel of oil reached negative values in April of this year, but its extraction affected the water, air, flora and fauna of its source? When will we understand that we need each other for our planetary survival and that the environmental sustainability uh, cannot happen at the expense of the life of others? If Western concerns about climate change don't go hand in hand with a deep process of social justice, it's a one-sided struggle, incomplete and probably ineffective. Not until we embrace a borderless notion of territory, which takes into account the specifics of local communities and also embraces interrelationality, can we attempt to really transform the, nature, the notion of nature as solely a resource to extract a direction aligned with the probability of human extinction. Borderless planetary awareness is not universalist, nor does it intend to standardize or reduce the complexities of communities. Instead, it sets horizontal dynamics based on such particularities. Borderless planetary awareness acknowledges that making the Guajira a place that cannot support life and losing the Waju community as a consequence, like other communities devastated by resource extraction, is not only a national failure, but a planetary failure. If resources have value as transformed sources, let's claim back the value of sources. Tracing resources to the source acknowledges the living beings that are part of a planetary equilibrium. Tracing resources to the source can contribute to a planetary society which is not based on production and consumption, a society in which we humans are also not seen as mere resources or workforce, but as sources in our own, our, our own right. For some original communities, underground minerals, such as coal, oil, and gold, resonate as sources themselves, ritual sources which through their existence in specific places underneath the ground, trigger processes of rooting and consequent care for the territory, sources to be worshipped. If colonization and neocolonization implies an imposition of a homogenizing voice and a consequent silencing of, silencing of the rest, decolonization must be centered on listening. Only through a deep listening can we begin to perceive the contingent composition of sounds and allow other worldviews to emerge? Perhaps it is time to listen, listen to the sources. Thank you.
Hello, hello. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, how how do I proceed after this beautiful text? <laughs> uh, damn it. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So, first of all, thanks Alejandra uh, Talia for organizing this and for uh, it's really it's really a pleasure and an honor to to be here. Um, and what I wrote in the um, uh, text that is in the book and what I will present to you today is actually part of um, my PhD research uh, and it was done from, this specific part was done from 2015-ish until end of 2017, so it's a, a little bit uh, Kind of, it needs a little bit of an update, uh, and this is kind of where what I will talk about here differs from the text that is in the book, in the sense that I think, especially after I learned the name of the publication with the border listening, uh, it made perfect sense to kind of recontextualize um, things that I will be speaking here about um, this specific object, um, which fascinated me for these two years. Um, so. Um, I think it's interesting to start from contextualizing um, where this jukebox is and why I'm interested, not in jukeboxes, plural, but in one specific jukebox and, uh, and why this one specific object is so important and why it articulates lots of things that are not exactly reproducible. It's very localized, as Alejandra was saying, um, but nevertheless, they mirror lots of other things and they kind of condense so many um, political articulations of what's happening in Brazil, what's happening since forever in Brazil and has gotten way worse um, after the election of Bolsonaro for sure, um, after the murder of Marielle Franco and it bears this recontextualization. So I'm interested in this object specifically exactly because of its capacity of articulating these political violences and um, long history of racialized violence in Brazil and specifically in the city of Rio, which was for a brief while, in case you don't know, the capital of the Portuguese empire. Uh, it was the capital of Brazil until 1960. Uh, and nowadays it is a beautifully chaotic city, um, which is both interesting and very sad. Um, but I think um, it's, it's kind of like this condensation of this, this history and that one object is capable of articulating so much, not only because uh, what it does, but because of how it does, when it does, by whom it does, and how it basically exists hidden in plain sight. And it's such a powerful device is what fascinates me and what I think it's it kind of, um, condenses, as I said already, but also becomes kind of a vector to talk about these forms of border listenings. Uh, as someone who studies sound, uh, it's passionate since forever by sound, music, um, but had for some weird reason to do three degrees in design. Uh, the idea of an object being like the mediator of these listening practices is for me very interesting. Um, also because it bears the importance of developing new forms of listening and new, um, new understandings of listening, uh, which as Alejandra and both uh, Daniela said, is not like something that um, exists in opposition to Western, if you will, modes of listening, but at the same time does not cancel it necessarily. So how does it emerge as something that it's both and known at the same time? It is literally at the borders and these borders that I'm, I'm I will talk about are not only like the literal borders between countries, but also like what Gloria Saldua will talk about border consciousness, uh, which is kind of a way of existing in the world that negotiates other forms of borders. And in this case, the borders between state and factions. Uh, you can call them criminal factions, drug factions. Let's just call it factions because I think it's way more complicated than that. Um, between legality and illegality, 
between the separation between the favela and the asphalto, so the neighborhood and the rest of the city. So all these borders are articulated in the ways that listening happens around this jukebox. Um, so I think it makes sense to start by watching and listening to something, uh, especially because when I say that I'm gonna talk about a jukebox, you probably have a very clear of an object in your minds and it's quite interesting to see uh, what kind of jukebox I'm talking about. So let's see, which I should click probably once more to play. Yes, all right. O crime tá aí, seduzindo a menosada, vi vários cair. E se levantar do nada do túnel pra cá. Geral sabe o que acontece. A paz vira negócio aonde a guerra prevalece. Os heróis matam criança e acham essa atitude nobre. Não enxerga que o sistema é só pobre, matando o pobre. Os ladrões vêm protegidos na alta sociedade. Concentrando a violência dentro das comunidades. Lança e copão, bala e balão. O pai trajadão de ouro, chave da nave na mão e na televisão. É o vilão que tá na fama, todas novinhas querendo se tornar primeira dama. Mas pega a visão, é tudo ilusão. O poder e o dinheiro sempre vão mudar de mão. Muito sangue inocente, a população com medo. A paz sendo mantida ou na bala ou no arrego. Na briga de gato e rato não tem munição contada. Os menores são rataria, meia, meia, só piscada. Com cinturão de granada. E a Glock com alongamento O tal do R10 Com rachadão de 200 A desse equipamento Tudo personalizado Vivendo no varejo e morrendo No atacado E o crime tá aí Seduzindo a menosada de vários cair E se levanta do nada Do túnel pra cá Geral sabe o que acontece A paz vira negócio Onde a guerra prevalece O crime tá aí Seduzindo a menosada, vi vários cair E se levanta do nada, do túnel pra cá Geral sabe o que acontece A paz vira negócio aonde a guerra prevalece A paz vira negócio aonde a guerra prevalece So um, there's a couple of reasons why I choose um, this specific clip to begin. Of course, because of the jukebox that uh, is featured right in the beginning that the, the kid puts the, the money in and then the song starts. But also because it has a lot of symbolisms, which I will get to as we go along. Um, so jukeboxes, so you see like it looks probably very different than what you imagine first. So this is kind of like how they look like um, in this kind of uh, situation in which they are placed, which are mostly dive bars uh, in underprivileged neighborhoods. You can find them in Sao Paulo, in, like, in many other big cities and small cities in Brazil, but in Rio specifically, it's a very interesting uh, economic model. Uh, I think there are, from the last data that I've got, there are like more than 20,000 of these in the city of Rio alone, and 98% of them do not play what you would call like licensed content, meaning that they don't pay royalties, they don't pay copyright for playing this kind of music. And that's also interesting because um, it plays on the, on the kind of different economic models that happens within the favelas and because of the, how the factions uh, control many aspects of everyday life in these uh, neighborhoods. Um, but also that video is interesting also to give a picture of 
um, the kinds of um, sampling material that is used um, by, by funk that is produced in the favelas, which I'll come back a little bit later. But you know, like this kind of gunshot samples, uh, clicking off firearms and so on, it's very important to understand how the, not only the songs that are um, being playing at the jukebox, but the sonic content, the sonic material that they use um, kind of tells a different narrative. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of like different ways that the jukebox can take shape. Um, I, th I think I think they are fascinating objects just by themselves. Um, and you know, when you shop for jukeboxes online, this is kind of the image that you encounter. So it's basically a desktop computer that you put in an enclosure, like a wooden enclosure. And that's the thing: you download a, a gigantic amount of music through torrents. And then there's like interface design to kind of create a system that people would choose and play music at these bars. So it's torrent, it's downloaded music, and it's mostly like all sorts of genres that you can imagine. So for those who know a little bit of Brazilian music, so there will be sertanejo, there will be samba, there will be pagode, but also there will be uh, Latin freestyle, which is the rhythm that gave origin to Brazilian funk. There will be like all these lovey metal songs, which are also very interesting, but a lot of uh, funk. But how funk gets into these machines, it's usually not through these torrents, but usually through either the um, factions that install the jukeboxes in the bars. So they will put music that is produced by MCs and DJs that kind of not belong to, but it, this is very important, a very important distinction. They do not belong to the factions, but they pay allegiance to the, to the factions. So they will install these, these songs that will praise these or that faction, or sometimes they'll have USB ports that people can just stick um, a USB and uh, drive and then just play whatever music. Um, so it, for me, what's interesting about these jukeboxes is not, so as I said, not only what music they play, but also how long, how loud, how often, why, when, by whom, and for whom. And this is where I will get to in a second. Um, and I think it makes sense to explain how I came across um, this specific jukebox that I wrote about, uh, because it sits in, um, in a neighborhood in the northern part of the city of Rio, so in, in a place called Complexo do Lins, which is, a mixture between like a, a more, um, as you would say, like a traditional with lots of square, scare quotes neighborhood and the favela all blended together. Uh, and Complexo is the militarized name that the police gives to these neighborhoods. But it's called Lins de Vasconcelos. It's in the northern part of the city of Rio. And it's a gigantic neighborhood. It has like more than 25,000 people. And I think in 2003, uh, sorry, 13, if I'm not mistaken, it was the 30th, fifth uh, favela to be pacified by the police, which means that the police does these really violent operations. They remove the drug, the, the, the drug lord or the, the leader that is taking control of that neighborhood, and they put in place what they call these pacifying units, which are basically another form of power overtake. You basically replace one faction with the other, this other faction being the police or the militias, which are like dissident policemen that operate a good number of criminal activities and who are also responsible for the murder of Marielle Franco and who have been more and more clear that they have close ties with our lovely president, Jair Bolsonaro. So you see that the militias and the police in Rio, they have this tight relationship and they take control of all sorts of activities that happen within these specific neighborhoods which are completely overlooked by the state. So they, they replace in many, in many uh, ways what the state does not give them. So infrastructure, uh, entertainment, um, possibilities for even, even jobs. So it is really like this power play that happens amongst what the state neglects versus the factions, the police, and within the police, the militias. Uh, so Lins is one of these pacified uh, neighborhoods. It was in 2013, the, the, like the, I think the 35th, as I said. But still, 
is still pretty much in control of one of the biggest factions in, in, in Brazil, if you want, which is Comando Vermelho, so the red command, if you want, uh, which, take, which is in control of a lot of neighborhoods in, in Rio. And this is one of the reasons, for instance, the main MC of this video that we, we just saw is wearing red from top to bottom. So he's also saying that he's um, is giving a shout out, essentially, to Comando Vermelho, uh, which means a number of things. Um, so I have no idea what's the next slide here, so let's see. Yes, perfect. Um, as I'm talking about the police, I think it's also important to understand how the police acts in Rio, um, and in, in Brazil, but in Rio is kind of like, again, a very condensed um, instance of that. So the, the, of course, as with many, um, many police forces, if not all of them, it has a strong ties with colonialism, racism, slavery, and so on. And the military police in Brazil is the strongest police force. It's like kind of a remnant of our dictatorship here. So imagine like if you are from the US or if you follow the US news, when you have like these big issues and then they say, oh, the military police is coming and then people know it's gonna be, a, you know, a violent uh, event for, every, uh, for everyone. In Brazil, this is the default. So the, the main police force in Brazil is the military police. And in the case of the military police of Rio, I, I bring the shield because I think it's quite interesting to see that you have the crown, the sugar cane on one side, the coffee on the other side, the two uh, pistols, and the, the, uh, the three letters GRP, which stands for Guarda Real de Policia, so the, loyal, uh, the Royal uh, Police Guard. So it has strong ties with colonialism. And this also reflects on how the police of Rio is one of the most violent, most brutal police forces in the world. Um, and of course, its body count is mostly black. Uh, and it, this number has only skyrocketed since Bolsonaro. Um, the number of, of fatalities, the number of people that the police actually kills when they do, do these raids in the favelas and you know, for whatever reason, it can be for anything. So this jukebox sits in, one, in, in this very complicated scenario and I came across it because I was interested in talking um, with, with people that I was naming them during my research as border listeners. So people that negotiate different realities in their everyday lives and they do so through how they listen to the world around them. Um, and one of the people that I, that I wanted to talk to was a friend of mine um, who lived, uh, still lives in, in Linz, uh, but her family is from the other side of Rio, so from the southern part of Rio, which is more wealthy, more middle class. So she moved there um, for a number of reasons. And she became herself a border listener in which like, she had to negotiate how to, how to live in a completely different part of the city and how to navigate everyday life uh, in, a, in an environment that is really different from the one that she came from. Um, which is not only without its contradictions and complexities as well because you know, it's a very privileged move to choose to live in one of these neighborhoods and she's well aware of that. So we started talking and I went to Linz to visit her. Uh, we sat at a bar, had a few beers, um, talked about lo lots of you know, instances in which this listening practice could take place. And then she said, oh, I have something to tell you that you're gonna be fascinated with. There's this jukebox in the bar near my, my house and I have been using it and not only me but my, my neighbors have been using it as kind of a social thermometer for what's happening around the neighborhood. And uh, I was, okay, interesting, go on, you know, and then she started describing to me how she would pay attention to the jukebox in the bar and what kind of music it was playing and at what time it was playing and, you know, all these little things to understand what was happening in the bigger picture of the neighborhood. Uh, so she told me that, you know, by listening to specific playlists, you know, the same order, the same songs in the same order, you could tell that certain people were there. Uh, if people went into the wee hours of the night, you could tell like, okay, something happened. And more specifically, the type of music that was playing, if it was a long list of funk and a very specific type of funk, she would know that something bad either was about to happen or had just happened somewhere else. Uh, and this specific type of funk is called Proibidão, which means uh, forbidden, or big forbidden, it's not 
actually translatable in that sense, but it's a genre, a subgenre of funk that um, emerged in the 90s. It, it does is not distributed by the common um, channels, so it, you don't have like records of Baby Down, like official ones done by the artists. You have compilations done by European DJs, um, but or European also European labels, um, but. The circulation of these songs initially emerged like CDRs and live recordings because of the lyrical content of these songs. So these are songs that directly talk about the factions, directly mention names of people belonging to the factions, like people who are leaders, people who are articulators. They directly mention certain um, people that, that the factions have killed. They directly mention um, firearms, they directly mention drugs, they directly everything that is happening around everyday life in these neighborhoods. And of course, when this started emerging in Rio, the media went all over it and started saying, okay, they are actually inciting crime and they are praising crime and they are like, you know, um, being proud of being criminals, which cannot be further from the truth. It's just a depiction of everyday life and oftentimes very fictionalized. Uh, so, but it becomes kind of the, the social language by which people discuss what's happening in the neighborhood. So by this long playlist of Proibidão, you could tell like, okay, the faction is strongly present here right now, so something bad will happen. And she started guessing, and we, we had like long conversations about it, and also with neighbors and so on, that it was also a coded message for the people living around it, because as complex as it is, and here I say like the borders between legality and legal illegality, state and factions gets really blurry because the factions actually take care of the people who live in the neighborhood because they are friends, they are you know relatives, they are people who, that grew up together, so they take care. So these songs being played in the jukebox were also a form of telling a message to people living around, okay, something is going down, stay indoors, don't do anything. So. All these listening modes, listening practices were taking place around this object. And of course, the police found out about it and started actually going to these bars, in all of the bars, but this specific one, and removing the jukeboxes from the bar with, with, under any excuse, the most common of them being copyright infringement, which the police does not have authority to do. The police does not work as a copyright, the copyright police, if you want. Um, so, she told me that the, the, the machine was being constantly removed, and of course, this would create tension, this would create anxiety, this would create the threat, the constant threat of violence that could take place at any time because of how the machine was being used. Uh, because these songs, when they are played in these machines, they threaten the narrative that Linz is actually a pacified neighborhood. They still... Uh, state and overstate the power that the faction has over the neighborhood. And that's super interesting because the police sees that as an immediate threat to the fiction that this, this, the, the, the neighborhood is actually in control of the police. So there's this, always this power play in which the jukebox kind of condenses. Of course, it's not the only instance of this power play, but it's a strong one because it's centered around what people are listening to, when, and which kind of messages they are sending around. Uh, and for me, it was quite interesting to, to think of Proibidão in those terms because Proibidão, I mean, I mean, I'm not from, I'm not even from Rio, and for me, Proibidão, I, my first encounter with Proibidão was actually through the media narrative that it was praising crime, that, you know, all these things. So for me, it was also, uh, the more I listened to funk, the more I, I got into, like, uh, talking to MCs and, you know, getting into the history, the historiography of funk, if you want. You see that it's not, there's nothing to do with that. It's quite clear. How it, how it serves its own function, both aesthetically, but also politically. And to think of Proibidão in, in those terms was quite interesting, because then the sonic content of Proibidão became even more fascinating. You know, like this idea of using uh, gunshot samples, the idea of, you know, putting in the lyrics things that would send coded messages to different people, and also to be like this sort of confront, direct confrontation with other factions, but also with the police. So. This kind of thing takes place in that context. And Proibidão is interesting because this mode of distribution also is highly dependent on the context. So you won't hear uh, 
you definitely won't hear a, a prohibidão of, for instance, Terceiro Comando, which is a, another faction being played in a neighborhood which is in control of Comando Vermelho. This could be a disaster. So it's really contextual in that sense. And which is another reason why I had in mind, so I had a long playlist that I brought that I wanted to show you examples, but then I, th I, I kept thinking about this border listening, that necessity of thinking about border listening, and I felt like we also have to think about what it means to listen to these songs in a different context. So what does it mean if I play these songs in this space, completely removed from the reality in which they are composed, in which they're, what, what does it mean if I bring these songs here and put them as objects of study? So, for me, that even make, makes, more, makes it stronger the necessity of thinking of the jukebox as this kind of hyper-condensing thing that only functions in that context with those songs and for the people who live around it. So it doesn't make sense for me to bring these songs and say, okay, let's listen and analyze the sonic, you know, the sampling, the lyrics or whatever, because we are introducing a different mode of listening when we put them here. And I thought a lot about that because for me, as I, and I thought about that like yesterday and today, you know, as I was deciding whether or not to play these songs. Uh, but for me, it kind of makes even this stronger the idea of what the jukebox does, which is an object that is, it, it serves this political function so strongly and articulates so many things, but also creates the threat of violence, that creates the constant threat of violence for both the police and the people who live around it. So for me, it was uh, interesting to think that it's not about the songs and it's not about the jukebox. It's about how they come together in the moment of listening, in that moment, in that context, in that relation that is established between the listeners, the object, and whoever is in control of that object, be in the umbrella control, meaning the who distributes, who takes the money out of those things, but also who is in control of what is being played. Um, in that jukebox. So it's not only about what is listened to, but how. So the playlist, the, 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 the sequence, the loudness, and also the absence of music. So one, another thing that uh, this friend Samara told me is that um, quite often it will be super loud, super long, and all of a sudden it would just go everything silent. And that was a clear code meaning something is going on now, run, you know? At, and b which puts in place another listening technique, which is identifying where is this coming from and you know, knowing where to go. So that all of this is condensed in one object, for me, becomes a, a sign that this listening, this kind of border listening that we are talking about exists in this tension, especially in that context, exists in this tension between military, militarized life and civilian life, you know, because in places like this, in, in, in the biggest, I mean, in a, in a huge part of Rio and in most parts of Brazil, in the biggest cities of Brazil, there is a constant uh, negotiation between wartime as normalcy. So the, type, the types of anxieties that are triggered, uh, and also listening anxieties, which is the title of this thing, um, it's, it's this anxiety that wartime becoming normalcy. And this idea that you have always to be prepared to identify and go, or identify, stay, or identify and, you know, run for your life. So an object is capable of articulating all of those things at once, and it demands its own techniques of listening, which are not transposable, which are not reproducible, which are not, perhaps even not theorizable. You know, so that's why I was thinking that uh, to talk about this jukebox in here is the perfect context because I think it brings again the, context, the, the necessity of contextualizing this within, within the history of Latin America, within the history of sound and listening in Latin America as something that does not belong to European or Eurocentric modernity, even though it's trying always to reach that thing, but at the same time, it also needs other types of modernities or other types of articulations to emerge from there. And this mode of listening around the jukebox at one object that does so much is one of these modes. And I think this is theory about listening that is happening there and uh, not, not in here, you know? Um, and that's, I think, important to think when we think about uh, how these objects become 
it's not because of what they do, but because of how they are placed and the original affordances, to use a very design kind of term, so what, the, what, the juke, what kind of listening did a, a jukebox in and by itself affords, this idea of communal listening, this idea of shared listening, which is in the history of the object itself, but in that context, in this context that I'm talking about, it becomes way more than that. It becomes a form of inwards listening, so to that, to that small piece of the neighborhood. It becomes an outwards listening, something that is sending a message to the, to the police, to the other factions, to the people that are living in other parts of the neighborhood. And it's also a broadcasting and a provocation, all at once. Um, and the police, when they criminalize the jukebox and they criminalize these forms of listening to be known, they are enacting what I name in the paper uh, an auditory state of exception. So they are taking something and criminalizing essentially the practice of listening. So listening is not noise, it's not a noise regulation, it's not, um, it's not a, you know, any sort of under the law crime happening. It's basically the criminalization of the listening act alone because it is listening to this kind of music that for them is a threat. So all these things is another way in which I identify how the police exerts violence towards um, people that live in the favelas, which are mostly black and brown population. Uh, so listening is one of these insidious ways by which uh, this violence takes place. So the constant threat, the raids to remove the jukeboxes, the, this constant fight between the faction and the police and how it centers around musical production and communi communal listening is something that um, uh, for me articulates quite well this idea of a new form of understanding listening as very contextualized, localized, and in, in that a border listening in and by itself. Um, I completely went off my script, but um, I, the only song that I would like to play, it's actually contextualized, and now we went there, um, contextualize with this whole history that I'm talking, and there's this whole story, actually, that I'm talking about. So one of the things that I did when I was there was to visit a couple of um, studios that were producing funk, and I was there talking to producers, DJs, MCs, and, you know, just trying to trying to learn, you know, what was happening there. Not to theorize upon, but just to learn, you know, just to listen. And there was this MC there, he was there just, you know, chilling with the other, with the other guys, and it's, it's also like a very guy environment, that's also important to say. Um, and, you know, we were talking about this, um, this production, how they were producing music and so on, and all of a sudden, he, you know, he stood up and he said, like, you know what, I'm gonna record a medley of all the Prohibidon songs that I know. And then he went and then he, he recorded and I was there present in that moment of recording, which was really, really nice to watch that, uh, how they produce music. So he basically had like a beat on his, on his ear, he sang like one, two takes, and then immediately two DJs, I think they were 16 year olds, they started like editing, adding effects. And you know, you will, you will listen, it, will, it becomes almost hyper real. And I think this hyper reality that they add to the production, it's also a form of adding a third narrative to that, a third layer into that um, violence that they are speaking about. Um, so they recorded the song that day, I just watched it, it was really, really interesting to see how quick they produced this music. And when I was uh, back, just, you know, writing down my notes, I got a link uh, to the, their SoundCloud in which the music was there. And in the message, one of the things they said, like, yeah, tomorrow it will be in all jukeboxes in Linz. And I, I bet it was, because it, it actually sounds fantastic. And uh, so, I think this song makes sense to play here because I think it's, um, in, when I was talking about context, I think this is a context which I, I personally can relate to uh, and can talk about with more certainty, like the, how it was produced and the decisions that were taken because I was there in a moment of listening and witnessing at the same time, you know. And it's a medley, so he sings songs that he composed, sing songs that are from other MCs, some classics, um, so it also tells a little bit of historiography of Prohibidão in that sense, from that neighborhood and the neighborhoods around it. Uh, so, and I think how we went there, so it's some five minutes long. If we have time, it's okay, yeah? Good. <laughs> Eu 
tô aqui na favela fazendo a ronda Broto na vai assustar, só de meiota Meu mano dá um rachadão pra cima do jade Aí meu G3 vem lá, 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 lá Vieram de caosa, instalando o PT E os cria tá cheio de ódio, a bala vai comer É, moleque é bom, geral dá um rachadão Dá pra cima da vez, cima do caveirão Boladão, pesadão, só cria de ódio Tanto ganha bala, eu vi os vermes correr Foi só tiro no motor Em papi de HK de meia, eu tô de GG Sabe por que, Marco, o bonde é assim? Nós vai de pra guerra, mas sem saber se eu volto Bonde de GG Os menor pau meia, preto e cheira, fica logo Os menorzinhos já tão boladão E o bonde é de guerra Eles dão um plato, 
Thank you. So thank you very much for both wonderful presentations. We have a little bit more time. Maybe I don't know if, if any of you have any questions. Otherwise, I have a few. <laughs> um, but first of all, maybe I pick up first on you. Um, I really love the way you connect uh, the Wahoo to the clubs and Kraftwerk, and I thought it was so much on point today being uh, the day of club culture in Berlin. We have like suddenly become like really at the margins of club culture <laughs> all of a sudden. And I was wondering because I also saw that uh, uh, your bio as an artist, how would you apply this uh, connecting the sources to the resources to your art artistic practice? Well, as an artist, I try to work, I, I don't like materializing my productions into objects. And more and more, I'm interested in, in for instance, questioning all the um, standard regulations of the white cube um, from the conditions of of, of keeping life outside to to temperature and all the carbon footprint that art implies, I more and more question it and like strive for an art that is bonded within the context and that is bonded within this state of urgency. So that in a way. Nice. Uh, and for you, Pedro, I was wondering because also when I read the text uh, that you sent for the publication, I really love the way you wrote f like from a conversation in a bar. Uh, it felt so familiar, like almost as if someone is telling you a gossip or something. And I was wondering, because I also saw that, that this was your PhD um, uh, project, and if you did it this way on purpose to avoid like an anthropological view, or because the most common thing would be like to collect data, you know, from the jukebox and all this. And I, I was wondering how, how this, uh, this project from your PhD came along. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't easy. Um, I had to argue a lot for that because, you know, you're brushing against institutions and against methods that are like so established. Uh, and I definitely avoided that consciously because I think, as I said, you know, these are not, you know, you are looking at certain practices as objects of study and that's not, that's a very colonial uh, move to do, oftentimes it is. And emerged also with my conversations, uh, from my conversations with Samara in which she said, yeah, I mean, we have to, you know, there's a, there was, for me to get into the studio, there, were, there had to be a lot of other conversations happening around because she told me, yeah, I mean, these are, you know, producers, musicians, and every, every person that produces culture inside a favela is tired of people from outside coming, observing, making notes, and going. You know, you have to establish a relationship. You have to, you know, you have to do a, a form of, um, it's, it's basically a form of respect, you know, a mutual recognition and respect. So there were a lot of conversations that had to go around that just for me to be able to be there. And still, it wasn't an easy process, and I completely understand that. Uh, for instance, I've something that I forgot to mention, I mentioned a lot that I'm talking about one specific jukebox, but I don't have a picture of it, because I couldn't. You know, she told me, no, no, it's better if you don't, because you're not from here. If you just come to the bar, take it, you know, this draws suspicion, and it's a respectful act of like, also very, you know, very problematic in and by itself. So um, what I try to do, so this is one chapter of my, of my, my PhD. I have other, like, it's all around um, police violence and sound in Brazil, uh, and you know, it's kind of like having a favorite child. This is my favorite chapter, um, because I think I, I was able to do exactly that, to go into an, an, an issue that deserves to be told from a specific point of view without trying to talk over it. Um, I'm, you know, 
I, I really like that Franz Fanon quote that he says, there is a point in which methods dissolve, you know, and I try to do exactly that, to dissolve the idea of method and just listen to the stories. I don't care if they are true, you know, they talk a different, if, even if they're, let's assume that they might not be true, they talk about a specific way of engaging with reality that deserves to, to be there, you know. So that's what I try to do. I don't think I was 100% successful in doing that, but I think it was a good, a good first step, let's, let's say. Yes, definitely. Um, so now, any of you have any questions or comments for them?